Good morning. My name is Brian Johnston. I'm the pastor of Gospel Light Baptist Church of Richmond Hill. I'm so excited that we're getting to hold parking lot services, drive-in church services every Sunday morning. We're meeting at 10 a.m. At 10 a.m. we start with a Bible lesson. I'm teaching the adults out here in the parking lot as they sit in their cars. Some are getting to sit outdoor uh, on chairs, those that are allowed to. And then also at the same time we have a teen class that's taking place and the teenagers are meeting in a different location uh, on, on the property but they're alone in a nice place where they're getting to enjoy that. Children also get to meet with my wife in Sunday school during that time and she has a class for the younger children. She's teaching the Bible, singing songs, having a fun time uh, with the children. We're doing this every Sunday right now and we would sure love for more people in the community to come and join us for drive-in church, for the parking lot service. Everybody's welcome and this is permissible. Uh, this is permissible by the all the government mandates and so on. So let's get back in church. Let's come and join us for these parking lot church services. Come be our guests uh, next Sunday here at Gospel Light Baptist Church. We're meeting in the back parking lot of Richland Academy, a private school located at 11,570 Young Street, just north of Gamble Road, beside the Lexus car dealership. We'd love to meet you. Hope that you'll come be our guests for Drive-In Church next Sunday. God bless you. All right, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm sure others will keep on arriving. We're glad that you're in your place today. Thank you for being here for our Bible lesson. We have been studying now just for a few weeks uh, a series of lessons called Always Rejoicing. And we're going to be studying verse by verse through the book of Philippians. We're coming to lesson number two called An Inspirational Goal. Lesson number two is called An Inspirational Goal. And we began this lesson last Sunday. And Lord willing, we will finish this lesson today. Today. The church at Philippi was a pretty strong church. It was a fruitful church. Uh, it was a church that had a lot of things going on. But that we know they were also a church that would face persecution. They would face trouble and so on. And uh, the Apostle Paul encouraged them to be a rejoicing church. It says in Philippians 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And God truly wants all of us to be rejoicing Christians, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what we may be going through in life. And God wants us to be rejoicing people. We said, I think maybe last week or the week before, how rejoicing Christians can be one of the best possible advertisements for the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are joyful people, if we are rejoicing Christians, uh, that, that, that is a, a, a good advertisement for our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus we're coming here in lesson number two to talk about an inspirational goal. An inspirational goal. We said last week that setting goals in our lives spiritually is important if we want to accomplish something for God. But it is vital that these goals are what God wants and not our own agenda. Our goals should be based on what does God want? What would be God's will for, for my life? What does God want to accomplish uh, in my life? The choice is not just to have goals, but whose goals? It should be God's goals that we desire in our life. That's what our focus should be upon. Our text verses for this lesson come from Philippians 1, verses 6 to 26. We won't read through all of that again at this time, but we'll get into the verses as we go through the points in our lesson. But I love verse number 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's a verse certainly that we can claim for our own lives. It's also a verse that can be claimed for the lives of our converts when we share the gospel and we win someone to Christ. That, that you know, God began a good work in their life. God began a good work in our lives when he saved us. And God is going to finish that work. God is going to perfect that work. God is going to complete that work in us that he began at the moment that he saved us. And of course, that is a lifetime process of the Holy Spirit of God working in us and transforming us to make us like Christ. And uh, there's a threefold process of salvation and sanctification and glorification. And we know that God will help uh, to do do that in our lives. Brother Dave, if you can help help uh, may, maybe uh, Miss Fatan to find a place, that would be great. God is working in us, and God, God wants us to be yielded to the Spirit of God for what He wants to accomplish in our lives. Everything about our lives ought to bring glory to the Lord, right? God's desire is that our lives would bring glory 
to, to him. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. God created us for his pleasure. God created us for his glory. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created us. God has created us, and it is his desire that our lives would bring glory to him. Let's just review the points we, we, we started in last week's lesson, and then we'll get on to our final two points today. Number one was an approved excellence. An approved excellence. If you have a handout there, Brother Dave has some pens if you want to use that and fill in the blanks and so on. An approved excellence. An approved excellence. In verse number 10, it says that ye may approve things that are excellent. That are excellent. We ought to always be striving for excellence in everything that we would do as a Christian, right? We ought to be giving the Lord our best. He deserves our best. He deserves excellence in everything that we do uh, in our lives. Letter A in the notes there is we serve a consistent God. We serve a consistent God. He is a God who never changes. He's always the same. Amen. He, uh, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says in Malachi, for I am the Lord thy God, I change not. And it doesn't matter what the, the, the what, what, what the century we're living in, what the condition of the world is, our God never changes. Our God never changes, and truth never changes, and God's word never changes. While, while many things around us are constantly changing, God remains the same. Psalm 102, in verse 27, it says, But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. God is always the same. He's constant. He's consistent. He never changes. Let her be, we strive for continuous growth. Let her be, we strive for continuous growth. The Bible says in Peter, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Do we have a desire to grow, to be growing Christians? We should desire to grow to the stature of Christ's likeness. And we looked at several other things with that last week. Letter C is this. We seek a celestial goal. We seek a celestial goal. We seek a heavenly goal. It says in Philippians 1, verse 10 and 11, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. One day we will stand before him. One day we will stand before our Savior. And that goal ought to be standing before him complete and without offense and like, like Christ. Becoming Christ-like cannot be accomplished by our own trying, by our own works of the flesh. It's got to be accomplished by allowing God to work in us and change us into Christ-likeness. Number two, we said this, an appointed experience. Number two, we covered this last week, but number two is an appointed experience. It's very comforting to know that God is completely in charge of our lives from the beginning to the end. And every step of our lives in between. The Bible says in Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Romans 8, 28 says that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. This means that, you know, there's nothing that happens in our life. There's nothing that we go through that God has not either ordained it or allowed it in our lives. God knows what we're going to go through. And, and the, the Apostle Paul realized that there were some things that were appointed to his life. There were some experiences that, experiences that he was appointed to go through, but there was a purpose in them. There was a purpose for the furtherance of the gospel. There was a purpose uh, of God's glory being accomplished and so on. We said letter A, Paul's troubles produced a bigger influence. Paul's troubles produced a bigger influence. Philippians 1.12 But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Paul said, some of the things that I went through, the trials I went through, the persecutions I went through, the imprisonments that I experienced, different things, it was all so that the gospel could be furthered. So the gospel could be spread further. Paul rejoiced even in the troubles and the trials that God allowed him to go through. It says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches, in necessities and persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The Apostle Paul realized that, you know, sometimes the, the trials that he went through and the persecutions that he went through, it was in those things that in his weakness, he experienced God's power in his life. He experienced God's power in a, in a, in a great way. And the gospel was furthered as a result of it. Letter B in our notes is this. Paul's trials produced a broader impact. Paul's trials produced a broader impact. It said in verse 13, so that, in, uh, sorry, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace. They're, they're seen. They're seen in all the palace and in all uh, other places. Sometimes trials are the pathway to, to great triumphs. To great triumphs. Paul's trials produced a broader impact, a broader ministry, a greater opportunity. And then letter C, we said Paul's testimony produced a bolder inclination. Paul's testimony produced a bolder inclination. How, how was that? Well, look what it said in verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. The Apostle Paul said that many of the brethren, many of the, the Christians, people that were saved, whether they had been saved now for you know, a few months or just a few weeks or even just a few days, when they saw, when they heard about the things that the Apostle Paul was going through and, and his imprisonments and so on, and yet his boldness to keep on preaching Jesus Christ, they waxed more confident. They became more confident. They were actually encouraged by the things that Paul was going through, and yet he was still standing for the Lord. He was still preaching for the Lord, and it helped to instill within them greater boldness, greater boldness to also serve the Lord. You know, we, we emphasized last week that people are always watching us. Right? People, people may be reading our lives like they read a book. And when they read our lives, when they see how we live, they need to see the Lord Jesus Christ, don't they? They need to see Christ in our lives, and they need to see joy in our lives, and they need to see a passion for the Lord Jesus uh, in our lives. They need to see that. What Paul was going through was actually producing greater boldness and courage and so on in others who were watching what Paul went through and watching how he, how he endured. Let's go on to point number three this week, and we'll, we'll cover the rest here of lesson two today. Point number three is this, an apparent expediency. An apparent expediency, E-X-P-E-D. I-E-N-C-Y, an apparent expediency. Whenever God is at work, it seems that there are always some who try to take advantage of the situation for their benefit. The expediency, the word expedient, has to do with something being advantageous. Sometimes there are people who try to take advantage of situations for their own personal benefit. In Acts chapter 8, Peter and John were being mightily used of God. There was a man by the name of Simon who saw an opportunity. It says there in Acts chapter 8, 18 to 23, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he, he offered them money. He's going to try to, to buy the power of God. He offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, pray to God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Paul, Paul was seeing something similar developing here during his ministry. And look what it says in verse 15 to 17. 15 to 17. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife. Some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Letter A there in your notes, write this. The grieving over an improper motive. 
the, in, the, the grieving over an improper motive. Paul was grieving as he recognized that there were some people that had an improper motive. An improper motive. You know, it's possible for us to do the right thing for the wrong reason. It's possible for us to do the right thing sometimes, but for the wrong reason. We've got wrong motives. Sometimes our heart is, is not in sync with, you know, the, the work of our hands and what we're doing. We may be doing the right thing, but, but our heart isn't right while we do it. And that's displeasing to the Lord. The Bible says in Isaiah 29 and verse 13, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Even Jesus kind of repeated that in the Gospels, right? He looked sometimes at the, at the Pharisees and so on and said, They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They honor me with their lips. It seems like they're doing the right thing in what they say and in their actions and so on. But God sometimes knows when the heart's not in sync. The heart's not right. Maybe the motives are impure, whatever. We can all say the right words and pray the right prayers and maybe preach the right sermon or sing the right songs or give the right testimonies, but yet do it all with the wrong motive. Paul reminds us that we are to be the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Doing the will of God from the heart with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. There's a big difference, isn't there? That's Ephesians 6, verses 6 and 7. It, it's probably in your handout. There's a big difference. You know, doing the will of God from the heart and doing what we do to please God, to please the Lord, and not just to please men. Why, why do we attend church? Do we do it to please the pastor or do we do it to please God? Why do we sing in the choir or teach a class or, 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 or uh, witness about Christ? Why do we read our Bibles? Do we do it for some selfish reason or some improper motive? Do we do it for the, for the recognition of men or do we do what we do for the Lord? The Bible says in Samuel, The Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. God looketh on the heart. When God observes ministry being done, He just as easily sees the motive behind that ministry. When, when God observes and sees us maybe doing something, we're, 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 we're ministering, we're, we're trying to serve God or serve people. He, he knows and sees, are we doing that just to be seen by men or just for the recognition of men or the applause of men? Or are we doing it for the Lord? Are we doing it for the Lord? You know, our motives are really just as important as what we say or do. Our motives are just as important as what we say or do. When it comes to pleasing the Lord, it's got to start in our heart with what is in our heart. Number, number three in our notes was an apparent expediency. Sometimes people may have improper motives. They may just seemingly be doing something for their own advantage and so on. Letter A, Paul talked about this, the, the grieving over an improper motive. Uh, it, it grieved Paul's heart sometimes when he saw people doing things and, and it seemed like their heart wasn't right or their motive uh, wasn't right. Letter B in your notes, write this. The gratefulness for an impeccable message. The gratefulness for an impeccable message. The Bible says in verse number 18, What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Philippians 1, 18. While God sees the heart, and God thus knows the motive, we cannot, right? We cannot see the heart of people. We cannot really see the motive of people. Paul was fairly certain that there were some that were maybe even preaching for the wrong reasons, but he rejoiced that Christ was being preached. He rejoiced that Christ was being preached. He was grateful for the message that was being preached. We don't have time to try to figure out everyone's motives for ministry. God will have to sort through all that, and God will be the judge of all that. That's not our job. What we can put our confidence in is that God will use His Word to accomplish His purpose. 
God will always use his word to accomplish his purpose. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 says this, For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word, God says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. If God's worth is spread forth, it will accomplish something. God's word will, will, will never return void. That's why uh, we, 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 so one of the ministries we support is Canada Gospel Project, where they're trying to take the scripture portion of John and Romans and mail it into every home in Canada. And they're probably, we've probably done about 60% of Canada so far, mailing a John and Romans into every home. But God's word will not return void. And I wonder, is that a waste of money? Maybe some people just throw it away. Well, maybe they do. But God's word will not return void. There's been many times in testimonies where people have taken that and maybe, maybe they've read it. Maybe they've just set it in a drawer somewhere. And years later, maybe somebody picked it up and they got saved, saved because of it. And listen, God has, has used that. God's word will never return void. If we're faithful in preaching God's words, when missionaries are faithful, when you as a Christian are faithful in trying to sow the seed of the word of God and plant it into the heart and mind of some other person, if you'll be faithful to do that, God will bless that. God will bless that. His word will not return void. So we said number three, number three in our notes, an, an apparent expediency. Letter A, the grieving over an improper motive. Letter B, the gratefulness of an impeccable message. Let's go on to point number four in our lesson. Point number four, an assured expectation. An assured expectation. Paul was good at keeping his eyes on the goal. Paul was good at keeping his eyes on the prize. The Bible says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the grace of God. Paul always had his focus on the end, on the finish, reaching the finish line, staying faithful to God until the finish line, you know, keeping his eyes on the prize, keeping his eyes on the goal. And he said, there, none of these things move me. Whether it be persecutions, whether it be difficulties, whether it be people that attack me, whether it be people that, that criticize me, these things are not going to move me. They're not going to stop me. They're not going to hinder me. I'm going to keep on. It says, neither do I count my life dear unto myself. They may put me in prison at times. I may get sick because I'm preaching the gospel and, and taking these missionary journeys. And at times I'm going into cities where not everybody loves me. My life may be shortened because of, of the, the, the life I'm living, but I don't count my life dear unto myself. Said in, in Galatians, right, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The Apostle Paul always kept his eyes focused on the goal. Paul had his share of troubles and disappointments and challenges, but he never lost sight of the finish line. Paul never lost sight of the finish line for, for his own life or, or, uh, and even for those to whom he, he, he ministered, those he served, those he preached to. There's an incredible story, a true story, about an Olympic athlete, a marathon runner from Tanzania. And I'm not sure if this man is still alive today or not. I know that even up to a year or so ago, he was alive. Brother Jerry Wyatt, our missionary in, in Tanzania, they have been holding a Tanzanian uh, stadium crusade, they've, call, they've called it. And people there love soccer or football, as a lot of the world calls it. And uh, they were able to invite this man, this, this Olympic athlete, this Olympic runner who ran in the marathon race. They were able to invite him to that Tanzanian stadium crusade. And he came and he uh, talked about that, gave a testimony. And I believe that Brother Wyatt even had the opportunity to lead this man to Christ. But there's an interesting story about this man. And, and many years ago when he ran for Tanzania in the Olympics in the marathon race, story goes like this, hours behind the runner in front of him, the last marathon runner finally entered into the Olympic Stadium. 
many times with the, with the marathon race. You know, it may be running a, a number of miles on a course and so on, but usually the finish line is they come into the stadium and they'll finish at a certain point in the stadium. Many hours behind the, 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 the runners in front of him, he came into the stadium. By that time, the drama of the day's events was almost over and most of the spectators had gone home. This athlete's story, however, was still being played out. Limping into the arena, the Tanzanian runner grimaced with every step that he made. His knee bleeding and bandaged from an earlier fall, his ragged appearance immediately caught the attention of the remaining crowd, who cheered him on to the finish line. Why did he stay in the race? What made him endure the injuries that he faced and, and just run the entire marathon, even when he was hours behind all the other runners and, and easily could have quit? What made him finish? When he got asked these questions later, he said this, my country did not send me 7,000 miles across the globe just to start the race. They sent me 7,000 miles to finish the race, to finish the race. And you and I need to remember that in, in running our race for God, we are called to finish the race. We're sent to finish the race. We need to finish our race for, for Christ and run the race that God has laid before us and run that race with patience as the book of Hebrews tells us to do. God did not save you just so that you could give the Christian life a try. He saved you so you could finish. God, God doesn't want us to become like Demas. Demas, who the Bible says, he, he, he hath, uh, Paul said, he hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. God wants us to finish. Doesn't want us to be forsakers. He wants us to be finishers. Stick with it. Stay faithful to the finish. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Letter four, or point number four in our notes is this, an assured expectation. Under that letter A, write this, tooth strengthening resources. Two strengthening resources. And we see these in verse number 19. Verse 19, Philippians 1, 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. If you could have two wishes for your Christian life, what would they be? That, that we couldn't do any better than the two things that Paul lists here, and that's prayer and the Holy Spirit. Prayer and the Holy Spirit. Certainly these two work together and produce amazing results. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 26, Likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, who lives inside every born-again believer, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Imagine buying a brand new car, parking it in your garage, and, and throwing the keys away. Buying a car, parking it in your driveway, parking it in your garage, and then throwing the keys away. While very foolish, that is exactly what many times people do as Christians. When we have gotten saved and we've invited Christ into our life, Christ has dwells in our hearts, the Spirit of God lives inside of us. But then we never pray. We never pray. We've got the power of God living inside of us. We've got the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. We've got the Spirit of God dwelling in us. We have the power within us to be able to accomplish great and mighty things through the Holy Spirit of God. But without the Holy Spirit of God being accessed uh, through prayer, we're going nowhere. We're going nowhere. The Bible says in Luke chapter 11 and verse 13, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? If someone tells you that they're praying for you, be grateful for that. If they ask you how they should pray for you, tell them to pray for God's power on your life. Tell them to pray that you would know the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God upon your life. Pray that, ask them to pray that you would have God's power in your life. 
You cannot have anything better than the strengthening resource of prayer and the Holy Spirit. To be able to pray, to be able to have the power of the Holy Spirit of God. What wonderful things we have available to us to help us in running the Christian race and living the Christian life and bearing the fruit that God wants us to bear. In fact, it's impossible without Christ, without the Holy Spirit, without prayer. We have two strengthening resources and that they are prayer and the Holy Spirit. Letter B in your notes, write this. Two sobering responsibilities. Two sobering responsibilities. It says there in, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 20, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always... So now also Christ shall be magnified. Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. It is our responsibility to live in such a way that God would not be ashamed of our life at any time. It is our responsibility to live in such a way that God would not be ashamed of our life at any time. A preacher many years ago by the name of Jonathan Edwards said this, So live, so that, you should sudden, so that should you suddenly die, you would not be ashamed. If your life was suddenly taken from you, if your life ended in the next 24 hours, would you have been ashamed to die doing what you were doing? Or thinking what you were thinking, or dreaming what you were dreaming? You know, we, we don't know how long we're going to live. It's nice for all of us to think, well, I'm going to live to be 80 or 90 or whatever. But people die every day. All right, my dad was, was 45 years old. He was the same age that I am right now. He was 45 years old when he was killed in a farm accident. My brother was 22 years old when he was killed in, in a car accident. Somebody ran a red light and hit his vehicle and my brother was killed. People have died in our area this week, this month. People have died in hospitals. Two precious little children died over here just on, off of Dufferin just a week and a half ago, two weeks ago now. We need to make sure that we're living today so that we'd not be ashamed if we face God today. We'd not be ashamed if we face God today, if we were standing before Christ today. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, the Bible says, And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Certainly we could pass away, we could be taken to heaven, but we also know as well, we're living in a time when the rapture could occur at any moment. Christ could come back again for his own, and we should be living in such a way that we will not be ashamed before him at his coming. When we are living obedient lives that are, that are holy or, or completely consecrated to God, we never have to worry about being ashamed to the name of Christ. The psalmist said, Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Psalm 119.6 So our first responsibility is that we would not be ashamed. And God would not be ashamed at how we were living if we were to stand before him. But also recognize there's a second responsibility there in that verse, and that's that God would be magnified in our life. That God would be magnified in our, in our body, he said, whether through life or through death. Is God being magnified? Is Christ being magnified? Is Christ being, you know, enlarged and seen better by the world because of the way that you and I are living? Our lives should help to act as a magnifying uh, glass, if you will, that, that makes Christ bigger and makes Christ look bigger and clearer and so on to the world around us.
where we go and what we do and how we talk and how we treat people and so on, it, it advertises what we are, who we are in Christ. God does not demand that we prove the gospel. He asks us to practice it, right? to practice it. How we live, be, be doers of the word and not hearers only, the book of James says. It is good to be a Christian and know it. It is even better to be a Christian and show it. Have you heard that before? It's good to be a Christian and know it. It's even better to be a Christian and show it. Show it by how you live every day. Sometimes people may jokingly say, well, there aren't, there aren't a lot of people coming up to us and saying, what must I do to be saved? Like, like the Philippian jailer asked that question, to Paul and Silas. But may I say this? There's no question in my mind that Jesus Christ was being magnified in Paul and Silas in such a way that the Philippian jailer desired to know the Savior or the God that, that they served. Perhaps no one ever asks us that question because they don't see Christ being magnified in our lives. Whether our neighbors have asked us that kind of question or not, do they see a difference in your life? Do they see Jesus Christ in your life? Do they see something that makes them wonder? And maybe they're too, too, uh, not bold enough to ask right now, but do they see something that makes them wonder what you have that is different? What, what you have that's different than what they have in their life? If we would live our lives so as never to be ashamed to Him, but to magnify Him in our lives, then there would be a whole lot more people wanting to know our Savior. In John chapter 8, verse 29 and 30, it says, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Even Jesus tried to do the things that were pleasing to the Father. And it says that many believed on him. Doesn't the book of Matthew tell us that we're to let our light shine and be the salt of the earth and so on? But what does it say at the end of that? Matthew 5, verses uh, 16, 17, and so on. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Our life ought to magnify Jesus Christ. It ought to magnify Christ. So we said letter B that there's two sobering responsibilities and the first one is that God would not be ashamed of our life at any time that we'd not be ashamed if we were to stand before him today. And then second responsibility that, be, that Christ would be magnified in our life or even be magnified in our death but that God would be magnified and seen by others in our life. Let us see right this two sovereign relinquishments two sovereign relinquishments in other words, things that need to be relinquished. Two sovereign relinquishments. R-E-L-I-N-Q-U-I-S-H-M-E-N-T-S. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 to 26, Paul wrote this, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I wot not. For I am in, I'm in a strait betwixt two. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless to abide in the flesh, which is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. It didn't seem like much was happening in the life and ministry of a missionary by the name of Jim Elliott. Not one soul had come to Christ through his faithful ministry. But when Jim Elliott was martyred, the Indians turned to Christ as they saw the Lord magnified through his death. Jim Elliott and, and, and Nate Saint and those, those other men that were, that were, were, were murdered that were killed, that became martyrs down in South America. It may have wondered, and people, many people maybe wondered, did they waste their life? No, they didn't waste their life. The very man who put the spear through Nate Saint got saved, became a wonderful Christian leader amongst those tribal people and, and so on. I believe that there's still even descendants from that family that are still there today ministering amongst those people down in South America. 
a great ministry came, but it didn't come without first there being a price, right? Christ was magnified through the death of a faithful servant of the Lord. Would you be okay with whatever God did? Would you be okay with magnifying Christ, uh, Christ being magnified through your, through your life, whether it be through life or death? Just so long as the only thing that matters is I want Christ to be magnified. I want Christ to be glorified. I want Christ to be seen in my life. I want my life to count for eternity. All of us think that we can accomplish much more through our lives than we can through our death. What about Christ? What about Christ? Certainly his life was valuable and serves as our, as our model for living the Christian life. But it was only through Jesus Christ's death on the cross that our sins were forgiven and eternal life purchased for us. We can rejoice today because Christ lived a perfect life, a sinless life. But then he was willing to die a substitutionary death on the cross of Calvary. He died as the substitute. He died as the sacrifice in our place. And it's because of his death, right, that we have eternal life. We can have eternal life. God was magnified in both Christ's life and his death. And he should be magnified in our lives as well. Lesson two has been called an inspirational goal. A goal. That goal needs to be glorifying and honoring the Lord. Christ being magnified. God's will and purpose being accomplished in our life, not our own. Our goals need to be wrapped up in God's goal for our life. God's will for our life. You know, goals are a funny thing, aren't they? Come New Year's Day, a lot of people make goals. <laughs> Everybody, a lot of people in the world make different goals about things. And that's fantastic on day number one and day number two, day number three. But lots of times those goals are forgotten by the end of January. There are so many obstacles at times to our good intentions. You and I don't know what is going to come our way this, this week or this month or this year. Maybe even before the night is out today. It may seem a long way to the goal of being Christ-like in your life, but it is never far towards the next step. Towards the next step. Remember, our objectives are not set on what we have done or what we would like to do, but rather on what we ought to do. Jesus Christ ought to get the glory from our lives. Jesus Christ ought to be magnified in our lives. And just take one step today in that direction. And take one step on Monday. If you wake up on Monday morning, decide, determine I'm going to take one step today in that direction that God would be magnified, that God would be glorified through my life. Take a step in that direction today. And remember this. Always remember Philippians 1, 6, that, that He which saved you, He which hath begun a good work in you, He will perform it. He will perfect it. He will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ, in the day that you stand before Him. He's still working on you and me. He began a great work in us when he saved us. But he's still working on us to make us what we ought to be. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, what should be the goal of every Christian? Every Christian's goal should be to bring honor and glory to God. It should be to bring glory and honor to God. May Christ be magnified in our life. Always remember that he which hath begun a good work in you, he will perform it. He will complete it. He will finish it. He will finish it. Let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to come to your word and study through the book of Philippians. I pray that you'd use these thoughts this morning to encourage us, to help us to uh, have the right goal in our life. Our goal is being wrapped up in your goal for our life, that uh, your goals for our life, that we would magnify you, that you would not be ashamed, that we would not be ashamed when we stand before you at your coming, or when we stand in your presence. Lord, help our lives to bring glory and honor to you, I pray. Speak to us, challenge us, change us, Lord, day by day. Day by day, step by step in the walk of the Christian life. Help us to become more like Christ. I pray this in your precious name. Amen.
Thank you so much for being here. Those that watch us online, thank you so much. We encourage you to share this uh, so that others can hear the Word of God being taught. Uh, please watch our morning service. If you're watching at, online at home or whatever, we'll start a new video for the morning service at 11 o'clock. We encourage you to watch that and share that also. Those that are here, if you need to use the washroom, you can do that. The, the front lobby of the building is open and there's uh, uh, main men's bathroom and ladies' bathrooms and so on uh, that you can use there. We'll try to get started our service here at 11 o'clock. The teenagers are meeting off over there somewhere outdoors. The children's class is meeting and they're going to come join us in a little bit and we'll get uh, started with some music and singing today.